Alright, today let's make our characters a little more dynamic by enabling them to move across the UI. I mean, this is pretty much mandatory. The odds of you reading a visual novel and the characters not moving is very rare. So the question uh, is, how do we move our characters around like that? First off, we need to be mindful of the ends of the characters that shouldn't be seen, like Raylene's missing legs down at the bottom. For this type of character, I'm probably going to move her left, right, or down, but never up to where the cutoff of her image starts. But still, how do we go about doing this? So, well, every object in Unity has a transform component. UI objects have rec transforms, so we can actually use the translate function to move them. But is that really the best way? And the answer is no. I won't say that it doesn't work, because no matter what, it's still moving the characters, but it's neither pragmatic nor reliable. To illustrate why we shouldn't use the translate function, I'm going to make a function called move2, which will simply take a vector to translate my character by. So passing in a vector3, I'll move my character in the scene. Give the amount, and since root is the container of our character, I'll move that by the amount. And there. Alright, now I'm going to jump into my character testing script and make it so I can move Raylene manually. So if I use the key M, so input.get key, keycode.m, then I want to move Raylene to a certain, by a certain amount. Alright, so now let's take a look at that. Let's wait for this to load up, make sure Raylene is active. So I press M, and yes, she moves to the left. Now, notice that she's all the way to the left of the screen, and when I change the window size, she is no longer in the same spot. In fact, she's moved quite a ways from where she was before I upped the resolution. Now, pay attention to the UI in the Scene Editor window. Do you see how it shrunk there? For those of you who don't get what's going on here, let me explain for just a moment. I've just set up four world space cubes at each corner of the UI for this current window size, so these cubes are going to stay in the same place no matter what the size is, right? Now with that in mind, let me enter full screen mode. And now as I pause the game and take a look at this, the UI has grown and so has the camera because a larger resolution lets it render more world space and the canvas simply grows to fit the camera space. So the larger the window is, the more world space the canvas takes up, and transform.translate operates in world space. So whatever we move in world space will not stay relative to the scale of the UI. In other words, this is a bad idea. So if we don't move in world space, obviously our movement has to directly relate to the UI using rect coordinates. So let's say that this is our UI. And let's just forget about coordinates altogether for a moment. So let's instead think of our position on the UI as a percentage from 0 to 1. And this is a 2D, so we have a percentage for the X and the Y position. For simplicity, let's make our starting point at 0%, the bottom left-hand corner. So if I want to move something to the top right corner, then my X needs to be 1 and my Y needs to be 1 also. So let's make it easier and just say our position is a vector 2 containing the X and Y percentage. In that case, vector 2.1 equals the top right corner, and vector 2 of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 means the object will be directly centered in the screen. Unfortunately for us, Unity already has done this. So let me show you how to get these values straight from the editor. Every rec transform maintains a local scale on the UI through the use of anchors. You have minimum and maximum anchors which constitute the four acute triangles you see on the screen, and each anchor pair is a vector 2 value. These determine how an object adjusts to a change in resolution in the window. I want you to watch these values as I move the anchors around here. 
Notice how moving from left to right of the UI steadily brings the maximum X value from 0 to 1. This is a normalized float, where 0 means left and 1 means right. And no matter the scale or resolution, 0 and 1 will always hold the same meaning. The same for Y, where 0 is bottom and 1 is top. The anchors give us these percentage values to determine where on screen an object should be, and once in the game, moving one pair of anchors will distort the image being moved, but when all four anchors are moved together, the image will instead begin to move across the screen. So if I take Raylene and set her max anchors to Vector 2.1, and leave her minimum anchors at Vector 2.0, she'll grow to look like this. And if I set both anchor pairs to Vector 2.1, then I've told all corners to go to the same single point, meaning she won't be visible anymore. So then there's only one way to ensure that we keep her visible while moving both anchor pairs, and that's by keeping the initial offset between them as we move. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. There's one more thing to keep in mind as we move the anchors. Take a look at Raylene right now, and tell me which corner of her is sitting at Vector 2.0, or x of 0 and y of 0. It's the bottom left, right? That means the corner is the one we need to worry about moving from percentage 0 to 1 on either the x or y axis, and the other anchors just need to keep their offset. So the minimum x and minimum y is the anchor pair that will actually be moving, and the maximum x and y will just copy their movement. Now there's just one more thing. If the minimum pair is what we move from 0 to 1, then what happens if we move our character to Vector 2.1? The bottom left will now be at 1.1, 1, 1, while the other three corners keep their offset, resulting in the top right corner actually placing our character outside of the UI. That's not what I want. If I say move all the way to the right of the screen, or Vector 2, 1, 0, then I want her to still be in the UI, but as far to the right as possible. So that means we have to do a little math to figure out where the true X and Y 1 values are in relation to the UI and this specific character. Basically, if I want her to move here when I say 1 on the X axis, then that means that this is the actual 1 value on the X line. The way I figure out where this new 1 value is, is by subtracting the min max x offset of this character from the maximum placement value on the UI, which is 1. So if Raylene has an x offset or width of 0.3, then subtract that from 1 and we wind up with 0.7. So for Raylene, moving all the way to the right while staying in the UI means moving her bottom left corner to the 0.7 on the UI. Then we just repeat that for the y-axis to get the true 1 value there at about 0.4. So after all of that, we've determined that this is the 0 to 1 movement area that Raylene can move within before she starts moving outside of the UI's rendering field. So now that we're all on the same page, let's go ahead and code this out. Make sure you add a new function called move2 with a vector2 as the target. The target will be 0 to 1 that we'll want to move our character, our bottom left corner of the character to. So create a private vector2, which will be the target position our character would try to move to. And movement is going to run through a coroutine, so we'll want to store it in a coroutine variable. And of course, let's make the retrieval boolean so we know whether the character is already in motion or not. So get and return only if moving is not equal to null. Now down here, make an I enumerator moving, which will control our character's movement. This will also take a vector 2 target, as well as a float for the speed. Then add a boolean, so we can just choose whether to move smoothly or not. Smooth movement will just use lerping to accelerate and decelerate the character and go ahead and pass in these variables in the move to function as well. By default, I'll choose smooth movement. So we need a way to stop moving if we're already moving. So let's make a stop function. In move to, let's assign moving as the new moving coroutine with our target speed and moving. 
But we can't just say start coroutine with this, because character is no longer a mono behavior. So instead we need a reference to something that is a mono behavior, and what better to use than the character manager's instance. So we'll say the instance, start coroutine, moving, pass in our target, our speed, and whether we move smoothly or not. Now before that, let's make sure we stop moving if we are moving. Now in stop moving, we can only stop if we're already moving, so check our is moving variable. If it's true, then we know the coroutine is active, and then we can stop it. So we'll say character manager dot instance dot stop coroutine with our coroutine which is moving. And then set moving to null. Now we can actually start the movement process, so start off by setting our target position to the intended target vector passed in. And now is where we need to get the offset of our anchors of this character. This will be called our padding. And the padding is just a vector 2. Remember, the anchor padding is just the max anchor positions minus the minimum anchors. and we're getting the anchor values of the root since that's our container. So now let's cache that padding in our movement coroutine so we only have to get it once. And now what we have to do to get the true one values on our canvas based on the padding of this character is do that little math. Make a float for our minimum, our maximum x value, rather, and that's simply the default max of 1 minus the padding of our character. Then do the same for the y value, and we'll know the range our character can move to while still staying in the screen. And now we need to get the actual target position, because the max x and max y are just percentages to multiply our target by. Remember that this is the minimum anchors that we're going to be moving, while the maximum anchors just follow. And now we make the loop. For as long as the minimum anchors of our character are not in the calculated position, we need to move there either smoothly or not, depending on our boolean value. So right here, make a conditional statement based on our smooth choice as to whether we're going to move or lurk to the target. If it's not smooth, then we're going to move. Use vector 2move towards to the current target by our speed. And you know, rather than multiplying every frame, I'm actually going to multiply speed by time dot delta time before the loop. So I can get rid of that here. Otherwise, if we do move smoothly, vector2.lerp from the current to the target by our speed. And finally, our anchor max needs to equal the current anchor minimum plus the original anchor padding. That'll ensure that we keep our offset as we move across the UI. And please do not forget to yield for the end of the frame here. As a matter of fact, this will be a good time to go ahead and save your work. And once we're at the target position, let's go ahead and stop moving.
Now in character testing, I'm going to add the ability for Raylene to move when I press the Ilm key. So Raylene.move2. And I'm going to want a target for her to move towards. So a vector2. Move target. I'll also want this. I'll also want the move speed. And I need a value for whether I'm going to go smoothly or not, so boolean, smooth, and just passing that in now. Now how about we go ahead and see if this works. The target is vector2.0, which means she should head to the bottom left corner of the screen. Unfortunately, I forgot to set her to be inactive at start. So let me enable her real quick, and there we go. I'm going to set my speed to 15, and I will smooth. I'll also set my position to 1-0, so she moves to the right. Hmm, okay, that's interesting. And maybe it would actually help if I multiplied the percent like I'm supposed to, instead of subtracting it. Now let's give it a go. Alright, perfect. We've now lurped to the side of the UI. See how the minimum anchor is all the way against the left edge of the UI? Now let's move to the right, which means vector 2 of 1, 0. Press Elm, and there she goes moving to the right. And that's working perfectly. She's not going outside of the UI either, which is how I like it. But the speed's a little slow, so let me speed that up a bit. And now 0 0.5 is the bottom center. 5.1 is the top center. Now she barely moved there just because she's almost as tall as the screen already. But don't think that we're limited to the range of 0 through 1. You can go over as much as you want. So let's do a vertical of 1.5. Now let's take it down. All right. You can see she goes outside of the screen there. So you can use this for even sliding in and out effects for characters. There's a lot of different uses you could do for this. And now if we don't smooth, then it'll be a much quicker movement. One could also say that that could be snappy movement as well. So choose what looks best. Now let's make her stop moving mid-motion. When I press S, she should stop moving and just halt where she is at that moment in time. And I'll just say Raylene.stopMoving. So let's make her move and stop. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> what this tank? Yeah, just ignore that. That was me fooling around earlier with the dialogue. Alright, anyway, here's the really good part about all of this. I'm going to move Raylene over to the right, and then I'll maximize the game window. That was good. So her air is at the very edge of that screen. Now let's maximize. And there we go. Not only did she adjust to the new window size, but because of her anchors, she kept her position on the screen. Before we end this episode off, let's allow the character to instantly reach a position rather than moving towards it over time. Maybe this should even tie into stop moving, where we can reach the target position instantly if we stop before it's finished. So make an optional boolean for that and stop moving. If it's true, then we should set the position to our current target. So let's quickly make a function for that. And I'll just call it set position and take in a vector to target. Then call that from stop moving and pass in the cache target position from the previous moving coroutine.
So to do this, we're literally going to do the exact same thing as in the coroutine, but instead we won't loop anything, it'll be instant. So copy all of this here and paste it into the set position. No smoothing at all, so I can remove this condition and just set the minimum anchors to the target. Now let me go to the character testing and make sure we set the position once we stop moving. And I'll just do that by saying true at the end of stop moving. So now we begin, and there we are. She snapped to that position once I told her to stop. And snapped, right there. If you find yourself having a difficult time remembering what vectors mean what positions, you can always declare your own preset vectors with titles such as left, right, or center. I'm going to do this by adding a class to my character manager that will hold specific positions and their vector2 equivalents. So I'll call it character positions and inside will be some vector2s with easy to distinguish names. So instead of saying Raylene.move to vector2.0, I could instead say Raylene.move to far left. And you could do this for as many positions as you may need, anything to make it easier on yourself. So that concludes this section for character movement. That was a lot of time for a short topic, but I hope it was worth it. So now our characters can speak and move, and in the next video we'll make them use emotions.